Amen. Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 16, reading through verse 24. I put it on the screen for those of us here today in the building. In the King James text today reads, Then said he, meaning Jesus, unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Hallelujah. Moving on up, Luke 14, 16 through 24. If you bow your heads with me one more moment for a quick word of prayer. Father, once again, God, we thank you for the wonderful presence of God we feel in the house of God today, we thank you for the glorious old hymns of the church. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. It overcomes the negativity, the bitterness, the hatefulness that is found in our world. Master, in the name of Jesus, we're grateful, God, for grace that is greater than all our sin. Master, today as the word of God would go forth, the preacher of the gospel asks you that you would anoint me, Lord. Help me to deliver unto the people of God that message which you've placed upon my heart for this moment in time. I don't know the reason. I don't know who's watching that may need to hear what I'm about to say. But I do know this. I know that there is nothing I can say that will benefit or help anyone without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And only a very foolish man or woman believes that they have anything to offer the people of God without the anointing. Touch the mouth, the mind, the heart of your servant today. Help me, O oh God, to deliver the Word of God in a fashion that is both pleasing in your sight and brings glory to your name. Touch the ear of every hearer. Help us, Lord, to receive that which we hear as seed that falls upon good ground, that it might not only take root and begin to grow, but, Lord, that it might be nourished and nurtured by soil that is fertile until the plant has grown fully and we're able to partake of the fruit thereof. Grant it this hour, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We all know the old song from the Jeffersons years ago, moving on up to the east side, to a deluxe apartment in the sky. Oh, moving on up to the east side. We finally got our piece of the pie. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you, the failure of others today to step up and make the feast, 
their priority. Listen to me, children. It's an opportunity for the rest of us, hallelujah, who might not otherwise have had opportunity to attend such an event. But now we have opportunity to step up to a higher place and a higher plane. Amen. Those who were once considered second class citizens are today invited by the King of Kings to become first class citizens. Hallelujah. Oh, there are those today who have convinced themselves that they're in the right class and they're in the right place and they're the right way. So when the marriage supper of the Lamb is finally announced and the table is ready and the angels go forth to call the guests to the table, there are many in the church today who, oh, I'll be on that list. I'll be there. Yes, I know God is going to invite me to the marriage supper. But what they don't realize is they've allowed things of this world, they've allowed things in this life to crowd out their walk with God, to crowd out their relationship with God, so that now there are things that they consider more important. I just talked about it a few minutes ago. There are some people for whom truth is less important than tradition is. Hello now. And that tradition and that love for tradition is going to cause them to miss out on the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh my goodness. But God will not have an empty table. Glory to God. No, the Lord says, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I'm not going to have an empty table. I will not have gone to all this effort. I'm not going to have gone to the cross. I'm not going to have spent three nights in a tomb. I'm not going to have gone through all that I went through in order to wind up with an empty a supper table. No, sir. And he sends his servants out. I'm here to tell you, I am today one of those servants, hallelujah, that God has called to go out and let you know there is room at the master's table for you, hallelujah. There is room for you this afternoon. Don't think that all these other people, well, there are people a lot more wealthy than I am. There are people who are more in the class of holiness and righteousness. Surely they will be at the table sooner than I will. Oh, no, 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 honey. This thing isn't about going to people who are the holiest and who are the most righteous. This thing's about going to the ones Listen to me, children, <laughs> who will answer the call. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. The word, of the, the, the word of God and the message of the gospel is believe, believe, believe. We don't see Jesus ever. I don't see the Lord at any point in time ever engaging in any form of social warfare. I don't see the Lord at any time uh, trying to engage in any kind of cultural warfare. I don't see him at any point trying to make sinners act saintly or trying to make people who aren't right with God act like they are right with God. No, I see him calling people to believe. So this afternoon, you have the opportunity to be at the feast not because you're able to live up to somebody's standard or somebody's notion of holiness, but rather because you're able to believe the Word of God. You're able to take God and His promise. Hallelujah. In Matthew 20, verse 16, the Word of God declares, So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few Chosen, Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, children, there is room at the table for you. In our primary text today, a certain man made a great supper. He invited his friends. He invited people who were in the same social class as he. He invited, I guess you might say, the... Uh, 
the guest list that you would imagine he would invite. He invited those that you would expect him to have invited. There are a lot of people in the world today that you might expect the Lord to invite to the marriage supper of the Lamb, but when the actual invitation comes down, they aren't going to make it because they've got far too many things that are cluttering. They've got far too many things calling for their attention. They've allowed themselves to become distracted. I've preached on this so many times. If there's anything wrong in the church of the living God today, it is with Christians becoming distracted. We are no longer spiritual Spiritually minded. We are no longer think, looking at things and thinking about things in spiritual terms, but we've become as worldly and as carnal as anybody outside of the church. We look at the world the same way they do. That's why I've said it before and I'll say it again. There's something wrong when the church looks at gay people with the same hatefulness and the same negativity and the same homophobia that their unsaved neighbor does. Hello now. Something's wrong with that. There's something wrong when somebody who calls himself a Christian can support and worship the same politician that the KKK supports and worships. There's something wrong when those that call themselves Christians can support and worship the same politician that white supremacists are worshiping and loving and supporting. There is something desperately wrong. Mm -hmm. My God, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that something is out of balance here. Something is not working the way that it ought to be working. The Word of God said we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're supposed to be separate from the world. We're supposed to look at things very differently than the world looks at things. We're supposed to see things. And what cracks me up is I got some people who, you know, they, they love certain politicians and they'll try to explain it away with that very notion. Well, because, you know, as a Christian, we see things differently. We don't just see him as a lion, conniving, sleeping around, slut puppy of a whoremonger. We don't see him as all of these things that the world sees him as. No, no, no. Because we're looking at things through spiritual eyes. No, 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 you're not. You're not looking at things through spiritual eyes. You've been deceived. You have fallen victim to deception. If you were looking at the world, if you were looking at life, if you were looking at politics, if you were looking at America through spiritual eyes, you would see things very differently and you wouldn't feel the need to elevate somebody like this in order to achieve your goals and achieve your ends. So you could feel like a winner. No, the problem is down at the bottom, the problem at the foundation level is that you're not thinking spiritually. You're not looking at things spiritually. You're not understanding things from a spiritual perspective. I want to tell you there's a problem with people in the church today. There are so many who are trying to move themselves up to a higher place in I'm going to use this phrase uh, carefully today, to a higher place in God's economy or in God's society, I'll say. And by that I mean, you know, uh, they start out as a sinner saved by grace. And then once they come into the church, Tommy, they, they don't want to be, you know, the low income, low status believer. No, no, they want to raise themselves up. And so they strive to become an usher in the church. And then they strive to become a deacon in the church. And then they strive to become an elder in the church. And then there are those who want to become pastors and preachers and teachers because they think that in doing so they're achieving some level of elevation. And what they don't understand is that in God's economy, elevation is actually going downward, not upward. What? Pastor, what are you talking about? Elevation is about going downward. Listen, when it's all said and done, the ones who wind up at the wedding weren't the guys at the top. It was the ones at the bottom. Am I telling the truth? So what 
What's the wiser direction to go in? To strive for riches? To strive for wealth? To strive for prosperity? To strive to have everything this world can offer us? Or what about those that didn't have any of those things? Well, in the end, those that didn't have any of those things are the ones who wound up invited to the supper. Mm -hmm. See, I'm here to tell you today, if you want to become elevated in God's economy, then you literally have to debase yourself, meaning you have to go downward, not upward. The further down you go, the higher up God sees you. Oh my goodness. The Word of God said in Mark chapter 9, verse 35, And he, meaning Jesus, sat down and called the twelve, and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. The contemporary church has falsely been taught that the Lord has called them to prosperity, wealth, and reckless consumerism and consumption. Most Christians today believe they are the better and they're the ones, therefore, who should be leading. They have, through a spirit of pride, elevated themselves rather than allowing the Lord to elevate them. But Christianity today requires we walk in a manner contrary to the natural desires of the flesh. We are not called to rule, but rather the Word of God declares we are called to serve. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, the Word of God, and 7, the Word of God declares, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Oh, but people today, they don't want to sit around and wait for God to elevate them. They don't want God to exalt them. The church today wants political power. The church today wants power within society. They want to exercise control and power in politics and in social matters. But they don't want to wait for God to cause that change to come about. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. I've talked about it in the past. When I was a kid growing up uh, in Connecticut, I attended a public high school. I went to the principal of that high school at the beginning of the school year, and I asked Mr. Miller, I said, Mr. Miller, would it be possible for some of us Christian students to gather together <clears throat> before classes begin every day and have a prayer meeting? Because the buses would get us to the school, you know, an hour nearly earlier than classes began. And kids be, you know, hanging out. And we actually had, in our high school, this tells you how old the preacher is, we actually had a smoking area where kids would hang out and smoke. And there was an indoor area uh, as well as an outdoor area. And... Uh, you know, a lot of kids would hang out there and be smoking and what have you before class. So anyway, I asked Mr. Miller, I said, would it be possible for us to have a prayer meeting before class? He said, sure. So I think that would be good. He said, y'all can use the conference room right here at the main office. Well, the conference room had a door that opened into a hallway and directly across the hallway was his office. So we were literally two doors apart from his office. Well, coming from a Pentecostal church, growing up in a Pentecostal church, we believe what the Word of God teaches concerning prayer, and that is the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So when you pray, you pray sincerely, you pray wholeheartedly, you pray emotionally. In other words, you don't just whisper words, you know. Uh, you wouldn't walk into your dad and ask him for something you really, 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 really wanted by just walking in and saying, uh, Father, may we go to the zoo today? No, you're, most kids aren't going to do that. Most kids are going to go, Daddy, Daddy, let's go to the zoo. Will you take me to the zoo? Let's go to the zoo. Am I telling the truth? 
Well, the Word of God said that we now, as children of God, have the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, which literally is translated Daddy. We literally can call Father, uh, God that is, Daddy. And there's a closeness, there's an intimacy in that phrase, there's an intimacy in that term. But the Word of God said, therefore we come boldly before the throne of grace. So when we Pentecostal, Holy Ghost filled people pray, we have a habit of being a little loud, we have a habit of being a little expressive. And I remember thinking to myself, oh boy, we're going to be right there next to Mr. Miller's office. And uh, luckily, when we started our prayer meeting we only had about four maybe six people started coming to it by the end of the school year we were packing in like 30 or 40 kids into that office uh, conference room and I mean we were praying and I, you could hear us praying out in the hallway you could pr hear us praying in the halls of the school you could hear us praying I'm sure in Mr. Miller's office and in the main office uh, reception area I know they could hear us praying. We had that room packed with kids, and we were earnestly praying. We were praying for the salvation of our fellow students. We were praying for our teachers. We were praying for our country. We were praying for missionaries. I mean, honey, we were praying. By the end of the school year, all of a sudden, you could walk through the smoking area, and guess what? There were fewer and fewer and fewer kids in the smoking area, literally, every day. There were fewer and fewer kids. By the end of the school year, that smoking area was like a ghost town. And Mr. Miller noticed it. The principal noticed this. He said, you know, it's kind of interesting, but there's a law of, of cause and effect, you know. He said, well, I noticed that when we started allowing you all to have your prayer meeting. He said, you know, there were few kids in the prayer meeting, but there were lots of kids in the smoking area. He said, by the end of the school year, things had turned around. There were more kids in the prayer room and fewer kids in the smoking area. You see, now listen, we weren't even praying for kids to quit smoking. We weren't, we weren't praying for God to help people stop smoking. Honey, you can still, you can quit smoking and still wind up splitting hell wide open. You can quit being a whoremonger and still split hell wide open. You can give up your adulterous affair and still split hell wide open. Doing the right thing is not what secures heaven. Faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ is what secures heaven. So trying to get people who are not believers, trying to get them to act right is an exercise in stupidity and an exercise in futility. It changes nothing. So we weren't praying for God to, you know, cause kids in school to quit drinking or cause kids in school to quit smoking. We weren't praying that way at all. But here's the thing. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, their sin. Because God's people are capable of doing the wrong thing as well. And will heal their land. Am I telling the truth? I just preached on that recently. Oh, I want to tell you, as we were doing the right thing as the children of God in that community, as we were doing the right thing, and we were in that prayer room doing what we had an hour every day to devote to doing, there was an impact on the school that was unexpected. You see, all these foolish Christians running around trying to change society. Oh, we're in a culture war. We're fighting for the culture. We're fighting for our society. No, 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 no. If the church did what the church is supposed to do, it would impact our society. It would impact our culture. You'd be shocked how things would change. You'd be shocked how many fewer abortions were committed every year. You'd be shocked how many fewer murders were committed every year. You'd be shocked how many fewer drunk driving incidents would occur every year. Yeah, but it's not because the church has been fighting to change these things, but rather because the church 
when it does what it ought to be doing, when it does as God has called us to do, and it fights a spiritual war because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to, it, to the pulling down of strongholds. You're not supposed to be fighting to pull down strongholds in Congress, you moron. You're supposed to be fighting to pull down strongholds in the spirit realm. And that is not accomplished with all your political activism and your political preaching. It is accomplished in the prayer rooms. It's accomplished through fasting. It's accomplished through prayer. It's accomplished through right living. It's accomplished, accomplished through Loving your neighbor as yourself, as the Word of God commands us to love. Man, if we would do the right things, the church would find itself moving on up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, you'd find yourself elevated. You would find yourself having more influence. When I left Nogatuck High School at the age of 16 in February of 2012, yeah, now you know how old I am. Excuse me, uh, 2012. I don't believe I said that. 1982, <laughs> 2012. <laughs> I wish I was 16 in 2012. <laughs> in 1982, I left Nogatuck High School. God called me to Texas. And I was going to Texas, and before I went to Texas, I, I had never lived away from home, obviously. You know, I, I didn't know anybody in Texas, didn't know anybody in Texas, except for my great aunt. And I didn't even know her that well. And believe me, that's true, because the longer I lived in Texas, the better I got to know her. And uh, can't altogether say I liked her more. <laughs> I just got to know her better. And... Uh, I went to the principal, Mr. Miller, and I asked him, I said, Mr. Miller, would you possibly write me a letter of reference for my new school? So when I get to my new high school, I'll have a letter of reference from you, my principal. And he said, absolutely, I'd be happy to. I got a bunch of letters of reference. I got some from, uh, or recommendation, whatever you want to call them. I got... Uh, <clears throat> My pastor wrote me one. There was another man in our church who was uh, an ordained assembly God minister, Howard Raker. And Howard went on to pastor a very large, very uh, popular assembly of God in Connecticut uh, shortly after I left. And Howard came to me and he said, Chuck, can I write a letter for you? He actually volunteered to write a letter for me. And anyway, I had a number of different people. I had a, a Mr. Miller and pastors and different ones. Well, anyway, uh, so when I went to Texas, I was able to give a letter of recommendation to my principal there. And the principal uh, in Texas looked at my letter and he says, my goodness, he said, you sure... You sure had a lot of power and a lot of clout in your last high school, didn't you? He said, the way this letter reads, he said, honestly, he said, I'd almost think you were a teacher, not a student. So Mr. Miller said that this student is so trustworthy and so dependable, and you can count on him to do the right thing, that if he misses class and he comes and tells you, that he was counseling a student who was going through a difficulty and that's the reason he missed class. He said, you can believe him because Charles doesn't skip class. And if, he, if, that, if that's the reason he gives, then you can bet that's exactly what happened. And of course he was saying that because I had had an experience like that. A young lady in our high school uh, had become pregnant out of wedlock and I knew this girl much of my life and one day as I was going to my last class for the day which happened to be an art class uh, this girl came to me and she was in tears and she was upset I said honey let's let's duck over into this room one of the classrooms was empty and we went in there and we sat and we talked and she told me what was happening and she was so upset she didn't know what she was going to do this is way back in the day you know and uh, <clears throat> So, uh, when time came for class, you know, I missed my class. 
Well, after she and I finished talking and I offered to go with her to tell her parents what was going on and all, she had the baby and raised the baby and everything. Uh, but anyhow, uh, I offered to go with her and she was so comforted. She said, would you really? Would you really? I said, absolutely. You know, I'll be there for you, honey. We'll, we'll talk to your parents and let them know what's happening and I'll be there to support you in that. Well, anyway, uh, I went to the class I had missed and I told my art teacher, who was an old cogity lady, what had happened. I said, I'm sorry I missed class. I said, but a student was under a lot of duress. You know, I said, I can't tell you who it is, but she's going to have a baby. And, and she's very upset. And the teacher, well, you, miss my, you don't miss my class. I don't care what your excuse is. But you go see the principal. So I went to see Mr. Mentor and told Mr. Miller, and Mr. Miller said to me, Mr. Morrow, any time, day or night, any time of day that a student comes to you and they need to, to talk to you and counsel with you, he said, you have my express permission to do exactly what you've just done. And he said, you have such a positive impact on this school. He said that uh, I want you to know that we support you in what you're doing. All right, and you say, now, Pastor, why did you share all that? Well, I'm going to tell you why I shared it. Because I never strove to achieve that. I never sought to have that ability. I never went to the principal and said, Mr. Miller, if a student wants to talk to me and they want to counsel with me, uh, I'd like to know if I could have permission. Do you follow what I'm saying? No. I earned that. I was elevated because I had proven myself and demonstrated myself. I did the right thing. I can tell you in all honesty, God is my eternal witness. I never skipped a class a day in my life. I was not a class skipper. I was not somebody, you know, trying to do things. I, I tended to be a little bit of a goody two-shoes in that department, okay? But the point is, when you do the right thing, when you do what you ought to be doing, then God sweeps in and He'll cause you to be elevated. Am I telling the truth? God will sweep in and He'll cause favor to come to you. He'll cause people to look at you differently and to see you differently. And they begin to, to, to give you favor. Tommy and I uh, have certain restaurants and stuff over the years that we've gone into and 80% of the time when we walk into that restaurant, if we pay anything at all, we pay very little. Right, Booby? Mm -hmm. And you know what? Never one time have I ever, 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 ever asked them for any kind of a discount. I've never asked them for anything. But every time I went in, I just showed them love. I just was friendly with them the way I'm friendly with everybody. And, you know, I tried to act toward them neighborly the same way I act toward anybody. And over the course of time, next thing you know, our money was no good there. We didn't go there half the time. And sometimes the person running the register would ring up our meal, but they'd ring it up, you know, like half price or sometimes a whole lot less than that. And they just bring in some little amount, six dollars, you remember? And we're talking about a place cost 30 bucks for two people to eat, you know. And they charge us like six bucks or something. And I mean, you know, God causes people to show us favor. But the problem with the church today is the church wants to demand that it be respected. It wants to demand that it be revered. It wants to demand that it be given favor. Am I telling the truth today? And this is the attitude of a lot of believers. Bless God, we're supposed to be the head, not the tail. Well, in the process of trying to be the head instead of the tail, you're acting like the backside a whole lot more than you're acting like the front side. If you'd be willing to be the tail, God will make you the head. Oh, there's a problem. We we got a problem in the church today. People are too busy busy trying to attain, trying to have, trying to achieve, trying to demand 
But the word of God says we ought to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in due time. It may not come as quickly as you'd like, but just because it hasn't come as quickly as you'd like it to come does not give you license then to pursue it on your own. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts or desires, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. What is Paul saying? It's very simple. What Paul's saying here is really quite simple. He's basically saying, number one, keep your spiritual glasses on instead of putting carnal glasses on. He said, and put all your attention into doing the right thing instead of trying to struggle for advancement, instead of trying to struggle for achievement, for instead of trying to struggle for prosperity and for profit and for money and all these things. Am I telling the truth? If we'll focus on on the things that are spiritual. God will bring us those things which are natural. The troubles we find in the church today are all caused by carnal minds which are not interested in waiting for the Lord to elevate His people, but who rather seek to elevate themselves. When the Lord does not do things which they deem necessary and urgent, then they do all they can, including employing men and methods of compromised integrity and ethics to accomplish their ends. Oh, honey, I'm going to tell you, when the church wants something so bad, and God is again, we want to end abortion in America, so we need to change. You don't need to change the law to end abortion. You need to live right and act right and be the kind of Christian you ought to be and let the church be the kind of church God's called it to be and just see what happens to the abortion rate in America. Just see what happens to it. But see, they don't, they don't want to do it God's way, Tommy, because God's way in fast life. No, so instead they'll get into bed with the dirtiest old flea-ridden dog they can get into bed with. They don't care about his ethics, political politicians. They don't care how dirty he is. They don't care how immoral he is. They don't care how filthy he is. They don't care how ungodly he is. No, as long as he's willing to do for us what God isn't doing for us. Well, i got news for you, honey. If God ain't doing it, I'm here to tell you why. It's because it don't need being done in that way. If God isn't changing the law, <laughs> then it's very easy to understand why. Because in order to have a positive effect and a positive impact on the rate of abortions in America, we don't have to change the law. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? It's that simple. We've got people in the church. Oh no, I can't sit around waiting for God to do things. He's not doing it. Well, I've got news for you, honey. When you start trying to do for God, you're in a bad place. When you start thinking you have to do things for God because God ain't doing it for Himself fast enough, um, you're in a very bad place. And the Word of God, the Lord says, there is nothing you can do for me. And isn't that the truth? Amen. 
God said, there is nothing you can do for me. They don't want to do what is necessary to attend the prepared supper, although they still think themselves of the upper class, worthy of an invitation. But the Lord seeks the people who are willing to submit and humble themselves to Him and accept His ways. Those who are willing to attend are not those who the average observer might think should be invited. And those who appear the most likely to be invited will have their own carnal priorities and agendas to attend to distracting them from the event which they would otherwise have been welcomed. Mark 10 verses 42 through 44. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Always cracks me up people who think they call themselves called to preach, you know. And I, I know a lot of people, I'm telling you, I'm, I've been in this thing a long time. I know a lot of people who go into ministry because they think somehow or another it's going to boost their self-esteem or it's going to boost their ego because it's going to make them a leader. Oh boy, I'm going to be revered, I'm going to be admired. Yeah, you're also going to be torn apart by the seams because the devil makes sure that anybody in a position of leadership in the church is under constant attack. Uh, so you're going to go through things you never dreamed you'd go through, which is probably why they say that uh, the majority of people who go into ministry as a profession, now of course in Pentecostal circles we believe you must be called to preach. You don't just preach because you choose it as a profession. But there are many other denominations and, you know, uh, churches that uh, people just feel like, you know, well, I can do a lot of good in the world. I can help people, you know, by being a minister. But statistically, two out of three will leave ministry within the first three years. Ministry has one of the highest turnover rates of any profession that is out there. Because people come into it all the time and their notions about ministry are so idiotic. Their notions about what it is to pastor, what it is to be a leader in the church is so convoluted. They, they haven't got a clue. They really haven't got a clue. This is one reason why the Church of God that I was in for several years had an internship program. Any man or woman that felt called to ministry had to go through this one year uh, program where you served under a local pastor, you were an intern in his church, whatever he asked you to do, you did it. If he, if he assigned you to teach a Sunday school class, you taught it. If he assigned you to direct the children's church, you directed it. If he asked you to fill in for him while he was away for a Sunday, then you did so. Uh, if he asked you to carry groceries to somebody's house, you did it. You follow what I'm telling you. And But the program, there were books we had to read. You had to read through the Bible in that year. You had to read a number of college books. They tell me it was two years of Bible college compressed into one year. Very stressful program. And they said, we know it's a stressful program. We know it is a very, very difficult program. But the Church of God said, uh, 
But there's a reason why we do it the way we do it. Because ministry is all about time management. Ministry is all about finding the time to do the things you need to do. And it is very stressful and it becomes very stressful, especially the more people you've got. So you need to learn to deal with those stresses. You need to deal with all this. See? So the, the whole level of stress built into the program was part of the program. <laughs> But I appreciate that program. And I've said this ministry will not ordain anyone unless they're willing to go through a similar program. And you know what? I've had dozens and dozens and dozens of people contact me over the last 30 years interested in being ordained by Grace Oasis Ministries. And not a one of them was willing to do that. Not a one of them wanted to do that. Not a one of them felt it was necessary to do that. See, they all want to rush into ministry unprepared. Well, got news for you. Most people are going to wind up leaving it inside of the first three years because what they think ministry is and what ministry really is are very different things. When I was going through the internship program uh, in the church I went through up north, uh, my pastor, Brother Carver, asked me one time, he said, Chuck, there is a Catholic couple. Uh, they're the parents to a lady that comes to our church kind of irregularly. She didn't come regularly. She was not a member. He said, but uh, her husband has crippling arthritis. He's in a wheelchair, and they really struggle financially and stuff. And he said, um, we're trying to help them the best we can. He said, can you put together some groceries in the pantry? The church had a pantry to help people, and I was the one that did the shopping to help load the pantry. And at the time, I also had a hobby of couponing. And I used to be able to buy all kinds of stuff with coupons and pay practically nothing for it. And long story short, you know, he said, put some groceries together and, and bring it to them. So I did. Well, some of the stuff I brought them was, uh, I brought them some uh, wash soap and I brought them some uh, um, laundry soap and some dish detergent and stuff. And when Brother Carver found out I had done this, he, when he found out I bought it for the pantry, actually, he was upset. And he said, well, you know, we're, but we're trying to give people food. You know, we're trying to help them with food. But I said, yeah, but Brother Carver, uh, people need these things. They need shampoo. They need soap. They need uh, wash detergent for the washer. They need, uh, uh, you know, dish detergent. I said, and if they don't have to spend their money on these things, then what little bit of money they do get their hands on, they can use to buy something to eat. He said, well, I guess. He wasn't so sure. He was crazy about the idea. So I brought these folks some groceries, you know, and some supplies, and about three or four bags, and I brought it to their house. I'd never met them before, didn't know them. Sat down and visited with them. They offered me a cup of coffee. These are Catholic people. They're not part of our church. They're not even part of our faith. That's okay. I, God didn't call me to love people who believe like I do. God didn't call me to love people who are in the same organization I'm in. That's not how this thing works. And so I'm visiting with them, having an agony. All of a sudden the husband says something to the wife. and She said, oh, uh, Brother Charles, she said, I'm so sorry. She said, this is going to take a while. She said, he needs to use the restroom. She said, so if you don't mind, I'll, it's going to take me a while. I said, no, ma'am. I said, you sit. You sit still. You stay right where you are. I said, I'll help you. And she said, oh, my word, no, you don't have to do that. I said, ma'am, that's what a minister does. That's what a minister does. It's not about elevating yourself, not about being somebody high and mighty. It's about serving and every opportunity, and even now I feel a blessing from the Lord on my head for that experience. Every opportunity we're given to serve and to be a blessing to somebody, that's just another opportunity for me to do what God's called me to do. I said, no, you, you stay. And I took him to the restroom and I had to pick him up and help him with his trousers and help him onto the commode and so on and so forth. I mean, it wasn't a clean job, if you know what I'm talking about. 
when my great grandmother was very ill <clears throat> and uh, not too long before she died she had gotten to the point where she could no longer get up and go to the restroom you know and I was at my grandmother's house and and great grandma needed to use the uh, commode and we had one of those portable things next to the bed and uh, I told grandma I said grandma I, I'm gonna pick you up and I'm gonna put you on there and she says my great grandma bless her heart she, if ever there was a lady's lady she was she was one of them real old-fashioned ladies you know and she was practically in tears she said I'm so embarrassed I said don't you be embarrassed I said you know th this is what I do th this is how I believe amen I want to tell you children that's how you achieve elevation not by trying to climb a ladder not by trying to run upstairs but by literally debasing yourself and humbling yourself and putting yourself lower because the lower you let yourself go the higher God will lift you up in the end hallelujah oh I want to tell you when it comes to moving on up it's all about being willing to get down and dirty, if I might say it that way. The Lord seeks the people who are willing to submit to His ways. Those who are willing to attend the wedding aren't going to wind up being those that you might have thought would have gotten an invitation. Am I telling the truth? In Hebrews 13, verse 17, the word of the Lord declares, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is, listen, for that is unprofitable for you. There's a reason why God has a chain of command within the church. There's a reason why God gives pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There's a reason why God puts people in these positions. And there is a reason why we are called to submit ourselves to those that are over us. Not to be blind, ignorant, stupid, obedient slaves. That's not what we're called to do. But we're supposed to submit ourselves to them. When they're attempting to give us godly counsel and godly advice and scriptural counsel, then we are obligated to submit ourselves to them. I've told you over the years, I've had pastors who advised me in some areas that I didn't altogether agree with their advice. I didn't agree with their thinking concerning the matter. However, I still did as they suggested. Why? Because that is profitable for me. Am I telling the truth? If it's unprofitable for me not to, submit myself to them, then obviously it is profitable for me to submit myself to them. And I understood how God's economy works. I understand how the kingdom of God works. God's put that man, that woman, that individual over me to guide me and direct me. May he, he, she, they may be right, and you just at the moment can't see it. But that doesn't mean they're not right. Am I telling the truth? You know, just because I thought I saw things better and understood things differently doesn't necessarily mean that I did. So therefore, uh, it never hurts to go ahead and follow the counsel. Listen, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 16. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Meaning, every law, every secular law for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put away Excuse me, ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as 
the servants of God. Don't you see what I'm talking about? God does things completely the opposite to the way the world does things. Everything God instructs us to do, everything the Lord tells us to do, literally works in direct contrast to the way the world does things. We've got Christians that January 6th gathered together in Washington and wound up storming the Capitol and creating a riot and hurting people and killing people. Honey, that is completely contrary to the will of God. That is completely contradictory to everything the Word of God teaches. You can try to put all the spin and spit on it that you want to. It was wrong. It was evil. It was ungodly. And when you wind up being punished for it, don't wonder why. The Word of God tells us in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 16, why? God's not going to show you favor. He's not going to allow you to get away with things that you ought not to have done to begin with. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Last scripture today, Luke 14, 8 through 11. When thou art bidden to any, excuse me, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him Come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Years ago, I'm just about ready to close up. I had a young couple in my very first church. I was 19 years old at the time. I had a young couple in my church that uh, were engaged to be married and they'd already made wedding plans and everything before they began to attend my church and Frankie came to me one day and he said brother he said we love you so much and we love this church he said man I wish we'd have known you before we made arrangements for our wedding we made arrangements to do it at this church in Danbury Connecticut and um, the pastor there, you know, we made arrangements for him to do it for us. And he said, but we'd love for you to be involved. Would you be willing to work with him? And I said, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. I said, that he can do your wedding. That's fine. It's no problem. I said, I'm, I'll be happy to be there as a guest. I said, that's no problem. And he says, well, but, you know, we hate to, you're our pastor, and we hate to have you just sitting there as a guest when you're, I said, no, no. You're not hurting my feelings. I said, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Well, it turns out what they did wind up doing was at the reception, before we all ate, they asked me to pray over their union and, and over the meal and what have you, you know. But even that was unnecessary. You know, the point is, God's people are called to humility. We're not called to be all puffed up. We're not called to think the Word of God says more highly of ourselves than we ought. This notion that, well, bless God, the church ought to be leading, the church ought to be, you know, we ought to be setting the standard, we ought to be sitting below the... That is garbage. It is satanic. It is from hell. I got news for you, honey. The Roman Catholic Church, and I'm not trying to be disparaging, don't anybody get mad at me. You're just being mean to, to the Catholics. I'm not being mean to Catholics. I'm talking historically. The Roman Catholic Church for centuries had that mindset. And for centuries, they tried to force people into conversion. They tried to push people into their organization and force people to, uh, uh, to become so-called Christian. And we saw historically what that brought. Okay? But that is, it's not a good thing. The church... Uh, God's people have today the same mindset that the Roman Catholic organization had for centuries. And it brought 
death, it brought destruction, and more than that, it brought a horrible reputation upon the Christian faith. Am I telling the truth? Oh, but we're trying to repeat the errors of the past by elevating ourselves, by moving ourselves up, rather than letting God move us up. In the end, it is not our job to seek and strive and struggle to attain elevation or promotion. God places us where He places us at any given time for a purpose and a reason. Moving on up is not a song we should sing as we try to make things happen for ourselves, but rather an anthem we sing as we rise in response to the Lord Himself, elevating and promoting us. Hallelujah. Those things which do not change remain the same because that is the will of God for the moment. Unless and until we learn to accept the lower levels, we can never know the joys of being elevated to the higher. We will never move on up and find ourselves on the invitation to the supper unless and until we're willing to be those people that others would look at and say, oh, they'll never get an invitation. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. If you'll stand with me this afternoon. Mm -hmm.